Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We pray this in the powerful and saving name of Jesus. Amen. Who's your favorite author or speaker? You know, if you, if you get a hold of one of your favorite author's books or you're, you're hearing your favorite speaker talk, you're, you're just on edge. You love those words. Those words can be so engaging. Words are so powerful. The most powerful, trustworthy, and true words of all are God's word. For example, in Genesis 1, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Okay, I understand it was completely dark before this time. He created light out of nothing. We're not talking about the sun, even though that's a big miracle. That's like day four, you know, light. When, when I try to think about that, when I try to grab onto what that's like, it just is so astounding, it blows my mind. In the New Testament, in John chapter 1, we see, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And just a little bit later in that same chapter, the Word became flesh. The Word is Jesus, the Almighty God, the Savior of the world. No wonder the Word of God is so powerful, it's Jesus. Later in the New Testament, we learn this as well in Romans chapter 10. Faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. God's word is so powerful that it takes hearts that are in full-on rejection mode of God and melts them to be faithful followers, loving God and loving people. Human words are also impactful. We've heard the phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. In our fact check world, we know that that statement is false because we've all been hurt, we've all been devastated by the words of others. Our words can inspire and they can also Tear people apart. In Proverbs, it says this the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. The tongue has the power of life and death. Words are not equally weighted. We're told that for every negative phrase or statement you and I hear, that we need to hear like five to nine statements that are positive just to balance that out. We've all heard words of encouragement, but the words that seem to stick with us are those negative words. Think about the, the difference between these statements. I'm so proud of you compared to, I'm not mad with you. I'm just disappointed. Or how about this? I wouldn't miss it for the world compared to or contrasted to, I don't have time for you today. See, our, our tongue is a, a small part of the body, but it's so powerful. James chapter 3 says, The tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Today we're concluding our series, Rebranding Christianity, where we're not so much rebranding it, we're just taking it back to what it was always supposed to be. In other words, that, that we would actually follow the words of Jesus, not just know them, but, but do them. Let's review to kind of catch us all back to speed. And in week one, we learned that no matter what the situation is, 
no matter what the circumstances, we are to always do good. Two wrongs don't make a right. We are always to do good. In week two, we learned that even though we're sinful, Jesus gives us the widest welcome. He extends his arms and welcomes us to him. And so then we are to give that same kind of widest welcome to all people. People who sin like us and people who sin differently than us. Everyone is to get the widest welcome. And then last week, as we went through the the scriptures and, and we thought about the question, you know, that we always have of what's in it for me, we learned to ask, instead of asking that question, what's in it for me, we learned to ask, how can I serve someone in the name of Jesus? And today, as we conclude our series, the question that we're going to look at is how can Jesus' love guide what we say? Ephesians 4.29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Usually where our minds go with that is like with cursing and swearing and and profanity. And to be sure, those are not to be words that are on our lips. James 3 says, out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. But unwholesome talk isn't talking about those things. The word unwholesome really means stinky or smelly, or trashy. We're not to trash talk. We're not to give something, more importantly, we're not to give someone a bad name by by using words that taint who they are or what we think about them. Think about all the rhetoric that you and I hear right now on our TV commercials. Sounds like unwholesome talk. Uh, another example of unwholesome talk is this picture. You're, uh, you're in a boardroom. There's this nice big brown table, you know, wooden table, beautiful. And there's a manager up there, and she's presenting her next major project. And then one person around the table says, that's a pretty aggressive project. We'll see if you can carry this one through to completion. What the person is saying is either, A, you know, you failed in the past, or I'm not sure that you have the qualities to carry this out. It, it's tainting her, rela- her reputation. Huh? Uh, it's undermining her character and authority. Uh, another example might be this. I, I know that some of you don't know this, um, but like October is a really big month for running races. 5Ks and 10Ks and half marathons and marathons. And so someone runs one of those races and posts a picture on social media with their finisher's medal on. And somebody responds, you know, posts, replies to it and says, boy, I wish I had a job where I could put in that kind of training that was needed. Or someone says, well, I looked up your time. Don't worry. I'm sure you'll get better. Wow. Wow diminishing the person's accomplishment. It's unwholesome talk. Gossip is unwholesome talk too. Gossip is verbally bullying someone else. And no one likes a bully. Here's how I'm pretty sure you know you're into a gossip situation. You're, you're on the phone talking with someone and you're talking about a situation with a person who is neither a part of the problem nor the solution. It's probably gossip, okay? So you're talking on the phone or you're talking with someone at work and you're talking about a situation and that other person isn't a part of the problem or the solution. It's probably gossip, okay? It's real likely gossip. And you find yourself in that situation, what you need to do is say something like this. Hey, you know, I'm really uncomfortable with our conversation right now because we need to get the the people involved who are part 
of the problem and a part of the solution so that we can actually make headway on this. Let's just pray that everything works out for the best for everyone involved. And you know why sometimes that's so hard? Because we're so used to the unwholesome talk. People tend to feed on gossip. That's why you and I, when we go to the checkout counters at the stores, that's why there's all those tabloids there. That's why when we, we turn on the TV, there's these TV shows with the latest celebrity tea. That's why you and I can go on, be on the internet and, and be able to click on the link about what's going on in the life of our, our favorite celebrity or favorite uh, sports star. And then we'll read through the article and it'll say things like may or could be. It's, it's filled with speculation. Hmm. That's gossip. It's often been said about gossip that it can travel around the world and make its way back before the truth can ever get out of the room. This past week, I ran across this poem on gossip. It says this, I have no respect for justice. I maim without killing. I break hearts and ruin lives. I'm cunning and malicious and gather strength with age. The more I'm quoted, the more I am believed. I flourish, I flourish at every level of society. My victims are helpless. They cannot protect themselves against me because I have no name and no face. To track me down is impossible. The harder you try, the more elusive I become. I'm nobody's friend. Once I tarnish a reputation, it's never the same. I topple governments, wreck marriages, ruin careers, and sully reputations. I cause sleepless nights, heartaches, and indigestion. Spawn suspicion and generate grief. I make innocent people cry in their pillows. My name is Gossip. You know, even if something bad is true, that's not our cue to go out and broadcast it all over the place. You see, sometimes we say some things because we think we're supposed to say something. Someone says, you know, wants to know what our opinion is on, on someone, and, and, and sometimes we say it, and it's not good, and we say it because it's going to make us look good, like, like we're in the know that we know what's all going around. So we sometimes say things because we think that we're supposed to say something. We think it's going to make us look good. And meanwhile, it hurts someone else. The reformer Martin Luther, in his explanation and application of the Eighth Commandment, which says, you know, that we're not to give false testimony against our neighbor, says this. We are to take the words and actions of others in the kindest possible way. The words and actions of others in the kindest possible way. Who comes to your mind right now? Who, who are you thinking, man, that's really hard to do with them? No excuses. Words and actions of others in the kindest possible way. And for sure, it can be perplexing and, and, it, and it's hard. You don't know what to do. Well, here's what you do. Remember that love covers a multitude of sins. Don't say anything. Love covers a multitude of sins, just like Jesus did for you and me. Remember the acronym we had a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about how we should use our, our mouth as well? We had the acronym THINK. The T is, is it true? The H is, is it helpful? The I, is it inspiring? The N, is it necessary? And the K, 
Is it kind? That gives us great guidance for our speaking. And so how can the love of Jesus guide what we say? Think before you speak and no trash talking allowed. We've all heard it said, if you can't say anything good, don't say anything at all. We've all been in that situation going, I know I shouldn't say it. And sometimes we do anyway. Don't. Okay. Consider this. No one is able to trace their problems back to positivity and words of encouragement. And so Paul, through the direction of the Holy Spirit, gives us this guide and direction for how we are to use our words, that we are to, to say only things that is what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. You see, even though we have a, a tattered and torn history, a, a broken history, a, a history full of sin, and missteps, and all kinds of stuff. This is what God says about you and me, even though we have that background. This is what he says about you and me and, and speaks to others. In John 3, he tells us you're loved. In Colossians 3, you're chosen. In Ephesians 1, you're redeemed and forgiven. In, in Ephesians 2, you're God's handiwork, a, a masterpiece. And in John 10, you're secure. You're safe with God. The more we grasp those truths, the more we can share that kind of truth, those attitudes, those kind of words with others. Imagine if we looked at others the way that God viewed them. You know, the same way he views us. We're to use our words so that they are helpful for the building of others up. Uh, imagine two friends, they're on a hike, they're, and it's, it's a long trail, and, and Sarah and Kelly, and they're going along, and, and Sarah's wearing out, she's getting tired, there's still a, a decent amount to go, and Kelly chimes in, you got this, Sarah, you can do it. Just take it one step at a time. And built up and encouraged by those words, Sarah is able to complete the entire hike with Kelly. See, Kelly didn't help her physically, but she encouraged her and built her up with her words. Sometimes it's just like that, just that easy, where we use our words to build up, encourage Comfort, offer hope, offer love to people, and it makes all the difference in the world. Maybe you've seen that, that hoodie or that sweatshirt that says something like this, dear person behind me, the world's a better place with you in it. If you've ever seen that shirt, I think probably our reaction's all been the same. Ever. It's like, oh, that's so good. That's so good. And, and the person turns around, right, and it says on the front of the shirt or the hoodie, you are enough. We've seen that. And we've, oh, that's, that's so powerful. And some of us, we've seen that sweatshirt, and it spoke directly into our hearts. We needed those words. Here are some other words you can say to someone to encourage them. I believe in you. It's okay to not be okay. You're doing an amazing job. I'm proud of how far you've come. I'm with you every step of the way. The smallest steps forward are still progress. God is with you. How can the love of Jesus guide what we say? The love of Jesus leads us to treat others like treasures and not trash. 
And keep in mind, for, for those of us who are Christians, when we talk, we don't just represent ourselves. We represent not only Christianity too, but Jesus himself. Okay? And we are to be salt and light. We are to preserve and protect and build up. Here are some words from Colossians chapter 4. It says, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. You see, the world may want us to win an argument, but Jesus wants us to win souls. And that's rebranding Christianity. So how do we do that? We use our mouths, our, our powerful words to build up and encourage, to inspire and motivate. We invite people to meet Jesus, maybe to meet Jesus at worship or in a life group. We pray with people. We pray for people. To win souls. We're to reflect the love of Christ in everything we say. I'm going to close our, our message with some words that are meant to be words of encouragement for you. From God himself. These words, God places his name on you. God assures you of his presence in your life. And God lets you know that he is for you. And these are words that Pastor Ben will actually end a portion of our worship service with a little bit later as well. It says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for speaking your word, your word of life over us through the person of Jesus. Build us up and encourage us with your truth based on what he has done for us and what he says about us. And then help us go out into the world and share Jesus and what he's done for everyone and his words his encouraging words over other people's lives too. We pray this in the powerful and saving name of Jesus. Amen.